Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm Jason Hubbard. I'm Vice President of Growth at Sells Intel. We have Tim Harris with us, who's Vice President of Marketing at Dialsource. Tim, it's great to be with you again. Yeah, great to be here. And a fun topic. Definitely, well, fun in, in sake of the fact that it, it's fun to get to get to discuss some of the challenges and, and try and solve some problems because it's all what we've got to got to march on and face. But definitely tough in, in the face of, of everything that companies are going through right now. Yeah, Tim and I have known each other for, for quite a few years, and uh, uh, we were talking about through a lot of the stuff before, just kind of getting each other's ideas. So, uh, you know, all of that in mind, uh, as you have questions, feedback, anything, pop that into uh, the side panel. We'll set aside some time at the end um, to, to go over those. But uh, we're all trying to figure this out as we go, so we're always interested in hearing what other people have to say about it as well. Absolutely. Right. We'll uh, jump right into it. A uh, quick agenda today. Uh, we're going to talk about bridging the technology gap between your office and your work from home employees. Um, so some companies, this is old hat. They've been doing this for a long time. Uh, others, this is brand new to them. So there's uh, obvious challenges involved with that. We're going to talk about optimizing your outreach channels. So how do you actually get in front of people and connect during a time like this? Uh, the challenges associated with cell phones, um, getting in touch with people, especially on the phone, is a particular challenge right now. Uh, people aren't in the office. They're not at their desk phones. Um, so cell phones becomes a really good way to get in front of people and uh, actually get conversations to happen. But uh, there are some idiosyncrasies and things to be careful with on reaching out on cell phones. Cell phones. Um, we're talking about reaching prospects when they're not in the office, and then we'll talk uh, through strategies for enabling inbound and outbound calling for remote teams. So I'll let you uh, kick this one off here. Absolutely. Well, what's changed? Um, you know, I think this this picture really resonated for me because all across America right now, offices are empty, and we know that. And so, I think the biggest inability is 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 able to see everybody. You know, I can't go and walk the floor and see my SDRs making calls and overhear what conversations are happening. I can't go and, and, and you know, get the ear of, of fellow leadership and, and see what's going on with certain accounts or certain opportunities. And so I lose that visibility and a few things start to happen. I think we saw it, it, it kind of perk up a little bit even on LinkedIn where people were talking about, well, how do I track what my employees are doing? And a little bit of that worry and whether you have a culture that supports, hey, I don't have those worries and I'm not concerned about what people are doing, but maybe I just really want to know so I can help them, so I can coach them, so I can make them better. I think either way, that, that inability to walk the floor is, has been massive. I and mean, Jason, how are you dealing with that at Sales Intel? Yeah, I mean, we're, we definitely fall into the category of one of those companies. We've been doing this for a while, so we definitely have a distributed team. Um, I think the, the area where we've struggled with that the most is with our, our SDR team, although we've, you know, we encountered that before because part of our SDR team is in India and part of it's here in the U.S. So for the India team in particular, you know, for management working with them, that's, that's been a challenge for a while. Um, you know, we rely on, you know, on tech stack and being able to track things in, uh, uh, in Salesforce and in HubSpot, um, Outreach. Uh, we just moved everybody over to uh, uh, LinkedIn Navigator Enterprise primarily to be able to get some additional insight into it. Um, but the other key to it is making sure you're doing those soft touches, you know, reaching out, uh, having calls, getting on Zoom meetings, having face to faces, both as teams and individuals. Um, you know, you've got to be conscious about doing those things. You can't, you know, and that's that's part of what's nice about being able to do it in the office is you don't have to think through it so much. It just sort of happens naturally and organically. Um, yep. And I think that's one of the biggest differences whenever you're not all in the office together. You have to actually think through and plan those things that, that would have happened more organically in the office. Absolutely. I mean, you don't have the water cooler talk, but now I want to take you through because we were similar to you guys, Jason. We're, we're a fairly smaller, agile team. We were all on cloud software and in, in solutions. Um, Gong is something that, that we use, um, Exact Vision, another one. But all of those solutions allow me to be able to hear conversations and, and dial source happens to record those conversations so I can, I can process them and start to learn about them. But the point is we've sat in rooms with leaders that have 2,500 sellers or support agents or service agents in an office where it was 100% set up to work from that office to have phone lines that come inbound and outbound to that office, to have 
desktop computers and, and business systems that were great on premise. And then when they went home, that sales rep ended up getting a laptop that they hadn't logged into before, an Excel sheet to call off of and their cell phone to say, okay, let's go and let's get this. And then whatever tools they might have to, to log that information. And I think that's where you take the inability to walk the floor. And then you compound that in some of these larger organizations with business systems that are totally disconnected from the reality of what we all face, which if you look behind me, it's my apartment. I'm in Sacramento. I've got my cell phone here. I've got my, my headphones. I don't have the, the, the Tiger King as my background. Unfortunately, <laughs> I didn't get the airbrush. But the reality is, is this is a totally different environment for anybody. And you take a whole team of sellers that are used to sitting there and getting feedback from one another about, hey, did you talk to this person? What was the outcome of that call? Should I go follow up with them? You know, teams that are, are selling into bigger accounts, everything's disconnected, which then leads to that increase in those virtual meetings. It leads to the, the increases in these, these Zoom calls. And I think it's fascinating because it takes a pretty high level of trust or time commitment for me to get on a, on a Zoom with you, Jason. I think you had some stats around like meetings being booked less and less. And I think that's because this communication maybe gets to be a little bit overbearing after a while. Yeah, I mean, the, the stat you were talking about, our CEO was on a, a panel discussion yesterday and uh, they the people he was on with had released the stat that meeting sets had fallen by 10 or 15%. Uh, and then the other corresponding stat to that, and that'll, that'll come forward in a lot of the other stuff we're talking about, um, yeah, so it's gotten harder to set meetings to get in touch with people. Um, the flip side of it is uh, almost everybody has reacted to that by doubling down on outreach. Um, so email and call volume has increased by about 50% over the same period of time. Um, so, you know, that 10 to 15% drop in meeting sets is even in the face of that huge jump in, in output um, and, uh, and outreach. So. Um, you know, we're dealing with a problem. People are harder to get in touch with, harder to get engaged, and you're trying to break through even more noise than ever. Um, so you got to get smarter about what you're doing, um, which, you know, great for us. We've got some content around that. Well, I think one of the interesting things just to go through that is what is effective and it leads into this. For me, if you're emailing me right now, I am, I am buried. I, I'm, I'm to the point in COVID-19 emails where I'm about to set a filter and just have them all go into a folder because I can just key off of that keyword. Like there are so many emails going out and so many reps reaching out to me about the situation that don't know my situation. So it's just this blind copy email. I, it's, you're about ready to hit email bankruptcy. That's, that's, my, that's my saying now. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, that, that actually gets really, really to the point of it. And the answer to this is not, hey, let's double down on volume, um, because what what we're seeing, what you know, I'm seeing across the board, what Tim and I talk about, and you know, pretty much every call I get on with another marketer, we wind up comparing notes, is yeah. you know, the the automation, the mass mailing, the using of templates, and you know, doing the same thing to everybody. Um, you know, not only is that not breaking through, but it's you know, similar to what you were talking about, Tim. Like it's straight up pissing people off. Um, you know, it comes off as you don't care. You're trying to take advantage of a situation at a time when, you know, you really need to be bringing emotional intelligence to the conversation. Um, and so, you know, not only just to break, to break through, but to also not tick off the people you're trying to talk to, you know, this is a time more than ever to get back to, you know, sales and marketing 101, really follow best practices. Uh, you know, do your due diligence, do research, make sure that you're, uh, you know, breaking people out into the proper segments. You're getting the right messaging, the right content in front of them. Show that you actually care and understand and know what they do, what industry they're in, what challenges they might be fa uh, facing. Uh, you know, another big one is, you know, show that you're human. Um, you know, I had one of my reps yesterday tell me that, you know, he had an account that had gone dark on him and, you know, he was banging his head against the wall trying to get him to respond. He took two minutes, shot a video, um, and just talked about how stir crazy he was and about how he was about to throw his kids off the roof. And 30 <laughs> seconds after he sent it, the guy gave him a reply and now the deal's back on track. Like, you know, connect, build a community. You know, we're, we're all in this together. We're all dealing with the same stuff. Be a human being. 
um, you know, the, the, the straight up hard sales push, the, you know, the generic marketing, all that stuff is just not working right now. What, what's I, think working the biggest right thing is the, I think the biggest thing is the temperature check. I mean, with yeah. everybody, the, the most powerful thing that I've seen happen is you call somebody, get them on the phone. You say, look, I know I'm a distract distraction. I totally understand that. This is why I'm calling and this is why I think I can help you. Are you having that challenge? Yes or no? If you are, let's talk. If you're not, hey, stay healthy, be well. Is there anything we can do to help? Nope. Okay, great. I wish you the best because all of our industries are having a problem. And then, and then I think the biggest thing is, is call and reach out to the people with the right context. You know, don't, don't go call an airline and, and say, hey, can we pitch you something? <laughs> you know, and I, like, have some, have some awareness, have some, some, you know, you, you said it best, emotional intelligence, situational awareness, whatever you want to label it, but, but really do that. And then I would say, listen to people and, and mirror what they're asking to really get to understand what's going on and what's going on in their life and try and dig into that a little bit more because then you're going to be able to know if you can help them or not. And if you can't, I, I, I always say at this point, you let them go, let, let yeah. it move on. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I mean, it's, yeah, you know, we've all learned the same best practices, but, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of people don't do them because they're not easy. Like they take time, they take effort, they take attention, they, they take expertise to do and do well. And so when times are good, like they were, you know, just a few months ago, um, you know, it makes it easier to get away with not doing that stuff. Um, but when things become like they are now, it becomes that much more important to, to actually follow through and, and actually do those best practices. And I think case in point, like we spent all this time talking about the content of the outreach as opposed to what's what's your best channel or what's the best, you know, cadence? Should you send, you know, three emails in a week and two phone calls or whatever? Um, you know, I think that's a product of two things. One, I think the, you know, the cadence and the the technical side of it and all of that is, you know, is overweighted, overplayed. Um, yeah. I don't think it matters as much as what what you're doing and, and how you're doing the outreach. The other is there's not really a, a good answer for like what channel, you know, and at the end of the day, it's really a trick question. Um, you know, the channel is whatever channel that they're engaged on and gets you connected with them. And, and it's reaching out across multiple channels because whether people primarily respond to you or connect with you via email or social or phone or, you know, whatever, um, you know, they're still hearing and seeing those other channels that you're reaching out on. And at the end of the day, a multi-channel approach is going to make you more effective at connecting on whatever that channel winds up being. Absolutely. I think you have to. And, and the one thing I would say is it's not a volume play, but it really is a conversation play. So wherever you can get their attention and then you can start a dialogue that's in real time, I'm finding right now more and more people do want to have real time engagement or real time interaction rather than the, the served interaction, right? The, the, yeah. the broadcasted interaction of, oh, okay, I just sent you a message. No, I want to actually interact with people. So that is, that is a benefit maybe for sellers and for support staff. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, if you, the great thing about this, if you can recognize what's going on and react, it gives you a leg up, um, you know, versus the people that are just still trying to, to force a round peg in a square hole um, and, you know, just trying to hammer it extra hard because it isn't fitting the way it was just a couple of months ago. Um, but yeah, back to the, uh, the multi-channel strategy. I love this stat, you know, no matter what channel is most effective for you, if you add two additional channels to your outreach, so if you go from one to three or four, you're gonna see a 400% improvement on your engagement. So like I said, don't, you know, just because nobody replies to your emails or nobody's picking up your phone calls, um, that doesn't mean drop that channel and stop, stop doing it. Um, you know, each one of those touches contributes to, you know, that magic number. And every time somebody does a study, it seems to go up, but you know, eight, 10, 12 touches, however many it is, um, each one of those contributes. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I just think we need to, we need to watch those studies. Otherwise we're going to get too many touch points. All of us <laughs> never get out of this. Yeah, no. absolutely. Uh, so yeah, we talked a little bit about at the beginning, you know, it's really hard to get people on the phone right now, especially if they're, you know, if they have an on-premise telephony solution, people are no longer at desk phones. So, you know, even if you have direct dial phone numbers for people at their desk, if they're not there and they don't have some sort of a, a system set up before that, that their cell phones, then that can be a challenge. Um, 
So talk to us a little bit about you guys are seeing that dial source uh, as far as trying to utilize cell phone numbers. Yeah, so a few things. First off, in our outreach strategy, we are calling on the cell phone. I mean, every report that we've got that's serving into a campaign for, for our reps right now is is prioritizing that mobile number over the office number, unless we've verified that the office number is, is piping through for certain companies, it is. Um, for our customers, they're dealing with it both on inbound and on outbound, right? They're having challenges that we've we've been able to help support and bridge the gap of, I have a, a landline phone number, a business phone number, and now I'm remote and I'm on my cell phone. And what do I do on my cell phone to get those business phone calls coming in so I can respond to them or, or so that I can do my job? And we've been able to help support that. Um, and I think part of that has been, you know, really kind of one, where's all the, where are all the calls getting logged? I think that's one of the biggest challenges, right? Then it's being able to like, how do I reach them? Yeah. Like how do I call them? Right. Is their mobile phone number there so I can reach out to them and then understanding what's happening on those calls. And then finally, the, the, the interesting thing is like, we've had to help customers with all the do not call lists because if they're now in compliant with do not call this because they're calling a mobile number, you still can't call that person. And especially something that's like a mobile number where it's even more personal, you really got to be careful. Right? So the compliance around that, the compliance around SMS, you're supposed to, you know, get that approval to be able to text message somebody through a business, but we start dispersing everybody out on mobile devices and the business doesn't know what conversations are being had, what conversations are happening and with who. So not only is the business losing visibility into all of that, so if we are reaching out to people via our mobile devices to their mobile devices, right? Now it's totally lost to the business. We may be connecting, but we also might be connecting in a really non-compliant way. So I think there's, there's those three layers, like our device and how we're receiving communications as a seller or as a sales team. Then it's, or as a support team, even because we're seeing a lot of customer, it's a lot of sales teams shift over to customer support. But then, how do I reach that person? Got to go find their mobile device, go find their mobile number, right? Be able to reach out to them that way. And then, yeah, am I compliant when I'm reaching out to them? And I think those are the, some of the really big challenges we're seeing. Yeah, it's been interesting for us on the data side of it because you know we, we long have, uh, have touted ourselves as having one of the best coverage for direct dial numbers. But of course, a lot of those direct dial numbers are uh, desk phones, like I mentioned. Um, but you know, the other upshot of the fact that we use all of our own first party applications to gather our data is we have the most mobile coverage out of any of the data providers out there. So uh, we went and pulled from our system. We've got 48 million mobile numbers for business to business decision makers. Not all of those have been human verified uh, and published to the portal yet, but you know, of course, seeing everything that we did, that was one of the first things we did is we we retasked our uh, you know portion of our research team uh, to go tackle those. So we're we're verifying about 78 I think this last week 78,000 uh, mobile numbers a week right now um, to add to the portal. Um, but you know all of that's on the data side. Uh, you know since you guys are really working with the people that are using this type of uh, data and actually making the calls, um, anything you're seeing as far as like etiquette for using cell phone numbers and stuff like that. Yeah, so a few things that I've seen really work well, and I've been doing a lot of seat rides and listening in um, with some of our SDR conversations, as well as talking to some of our customers in an open forum. And um, anyone reach out after if you'd like to be part of some of those discussions, because happy to, to kind of open up that, that conversation to other people in the industry trying to figure it out is, one, I think admitting you're a distraction is, is first and foremost, just etiquette wise. It's amazing how powerful that really is. Like it almost sets people back. We've had our SDRs just saying, hey, look, I, I understand I'm a distraction, but let me tell you something. Let me, let me talk to you just for, can I have a few minutes of your time or a few seconds of your time? Let me just tell you something. And that's been powerful. Um, the second one is, is make sure your phone numbers aren't showing up unknown or potential spam on people's cell phones. I mean, that's, that's super critical. So the phone number you're calling from you know, we've had, we've had people come over and prospects come over because they go, ah, I found out that my dialing solution or the, or the tool that I'm using is coming up as a spam number or a bad number, or whatever it might be on somebody's phone. That's not good. So, so check that, make sure that's not, not working on improperly. And then, um, I think the last thing is the DNC compliance and the SMS compliance. Like just be careful with that stuff. Like don't set some parameters around it. Try and research that. There's different, you know, 
laws and state reg regulation, like CCPA, GDPR compliance, stuff like that. Just be careful. Um, and I think work with your data providers um, to make sure that you are compliant, as well as make sure they're in Salesforce or in CRM. You know, I think some of the things that the faster you move, sometimes the bad decisions are made. And I think of that with a company who might have CRM, but because they need to get a report out really quickly, they go and run an Excel sheet or send it out in a PDF. And it may not include DNC numbers. And because I'm not in the office logged into the system, I might just be calling this list on my cell phone. And so maybe those are numbers that I shouldn't have now logged into my personal device. Maybe so. So as a business, I think kind of tidying up those services and, and saying, look, I can have a rep using their cell phone, but they need to call through a system that routes that, that cell phone to my business lines or to my inbound and outbound numbers. I think there's, there's compliance stuff around that that I'd be really careful with. Yeah, I mean, I think I think a couple of keys there. Be be human, and then I really like the part about you know acknowledging that you are a distraction. You know, this goes hand in hand with something I've trained my salespeople with, which is uh, you know go into the call saying you know explicitly you know here's a little mini contract. I mean, don't tell them it's a contract, but you know, hey, can I have you know 60 seconds, 40 seconds, whatever. Um, you know, whatever your time is, and then clearly say what you're going to try and accomplish during that time frame. Be upfront. Here, here are the terms of the engagement. You know, is that something you're willing to do? Um, and it's a great way to to kind of get get through the door and break down that barrier. Yeah. All right. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> face in hand here. Yeah, that one. <laughs> I think I think we've already covered most of this, but yeah, how do you how do you reach somebody who's not in the office? Um, you know, acknowledge you're an interruption, be empathetic, um, personalize, prioritize, uh, and use multiple channels. So, uh, you know, nice little recap on what we, what we just sort of riffed on there. All right. So, you know, we went through all of this, you know, what do you need to do to get all of these pieces together and make sure that your team's actually productive whenever they're remote? Um, need to make sure they've got the tools they need. So, um, you know, if you have, obviously, if you've got an on-premise phone system, an on-premise, uh, you know, email system, uh, on-premise CRM, you know, all these tools are going to have limited effectiveness during this. So, um, you know, thankfully, a lot of us have been on the path to moving to the cloud for the last decade or so. Um, for those that have, then you're better equipped than some others. Um, but, you know, and you're seeing a lot of people having to make this move in a hurry. Um, but make sure you've got the tools that you need. Um, make sure that you're logging activities and workflow. Um, you know, it's harder than ever. You're not all in the same office. You're not face to face um, to stay on top of what everybody's doing and make sure that they're actually doing it right. Um, and then also make sure that you've got the information they need. You know, it's not just tools. It's not just data. You know, it's making sure they understand processes. Um, you know, what what to do. You know, even all the way down to. Uh, hey, here, here's some tips and tricks and guidance on how to effectively work from home, period. Um, you yeah. know, how do you, how do you remove distractions? How do you create an effective, productive workspace? How do you deal with kids running around while you're trying to work? Um, you know, all that stuff. So, you know, all the way down even to the soft touch stuff about, you know, hey, here's some advice and guidance on how to actually be effective working from home. Yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, I think people feel more disconnected and they have those challenges on, on the personal side, but at the same time, there's a lot of productivity gain in, in that side as well. So I think the reality too is start getting prepared right now for what a new normal is. I think there's a lot of companies that will prove to themselves they can do a work from home or a remote workforce, or they can do a, a distributed workforce. And they might maintain that following this epidemic and following the, these challenges, but start preparing your company to be versatile and flexible, to be able to go remote or be in the office and not have to shift systems and have to shift everything around in order to accomplish that. Because I think that is the one thing that flexibility in organizations is going to be absolutely critical for, for companies that survive. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there there may be a degree of going back to normal, but I mean, in a lot of ways, it's going to be the new normal for the foreseeable future. Um, yeah, well, and that leads into the tech stack, and that's that's part of this. I mean, those tools that you need to to be flexible and to be able to reach everybody in a compliant way, right? There's a lot of a lot of companies that finance, health, medical. You know, there's a lot of compliance in those industries, and and 
having the right connections and being able to connect to a secure network and, and all of those different things is, is critical for them. And it adds a lot of complexity to their system. Yep. Yep. So yeah, uh, you know, we're getting close to the end here. I want to make sure we've got some time for a Q and a, but, uh, you know, quick rundown on, you know, basics of tech stack that you're going to want to have. Um, you need stuff around cloud collaboration. So, you know, G suite, office 365, Slack, hangouts, teams, uh, you know, ways you all to get together virtually, uh, be able to work on projects on documents all together at the same time. Um, you know, uh, version control is a nightmare if you all have, you know, this, your own version of a doc saved on your individual computer. Um, you know, if you've got three or four or five different people trying to edit the same thing at the same time and you wind up with multiple versions of the same thing, uh, that's just a nightmare to try and work off of. So make sure you've got ways to, to collaborate in the cloud. Um, virtual meetings are crucial, like we've talked about, you know, things like Zoom, GoToMeeting, Hangouts, BlueJeans. Um, CRM has been crucial for a long time. You know, virtually every major organization has some sort of CRM in place. Most of those have moved to the cloud. Uh, you know, Salesforce, of course, led the charge on that. Um, telephony, you know, a lot of people have been caught flat footed on this front. Um, so having something set up where it can forward the cell phones, you've got, you know, a VOIP system like Vonage or Ring Central. Um, coaching productivity, Tim, you hit on these. Uh, things like Exact Vision, Gong, Protoscore, yeah. Ambition Level 11, where they actually allow you to be able to look at what's going on with your team, uh, what's your productivity levels, what type of conversations they're having, being able to record things like sessions, be able to do virtual coaching, and then stuff around sales enablement that's going to really uh, empower your team to be able to reach out effectively. So things like Dial Source. Um, like our web driver extension was a, a free prospecting tool. Um, you can go on LinkedIn or a company's website and pull people's contact information right off of it. You know, MixMax, LinkedIn Navigator. Um, so make sure your team has the tools they need to be effective and be productive uh, you know, during a situation like this. Anything I missed them? I think it's just critical like that, that CRM, don't let it go by the wayside now that you're not in an office and not actually sitting and, and, and meeting with people on a regular basis because as a manager, it's your visibility tool. And as a, a seller, it is your way into knowing who's talking to who and what conversations are happening. And I think like that is truly what CRM was built to do. It's that platform to hold those interactions. And I think getting your systems to work that way as easy as possible for your organization is going to be critical because otherwise I see people putting that to the shelf, working off Excel sheets, working off other places. And I think you've got to log all those activities and learn from them. And I think that's the real critical piece here is we don't know what's going to work best and yeah. everything's going to be a little bit different for each organization. Yeah. And I think for me, I mean, the key to, to being effective in, in any sort of situation like this, especially whenever you're, you're remote and distributed is it, it all really boils down to communication. Um, you need to over communicate and what we're looking at here are primarily tools that allow you to keep those communication channels open um, and to know what's going on. Um, but you've got to be conscious about what you're doing. You've got to put in the effort to, to make sure that you are communicating, you're getting the word out, you know what's going on, you're checking in with each other. And so, you know, these tools really facilitate that, but it's, it's not going to do it for you. You've got to, that's got to be a priority for you. Yep. No, absolutely. Cool. Uh, we're a little bit over, but uh, I know I don't have a hard stop. Um, if you don't, um, we can hang around here for as long as uh, anybody has any questions for us. Yeah, happy to answer some questions right now. All right. Let's see. All right, James had some stuff for us. Uh, James is a good friend of mine. Glad you're on here. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if, if nobody has any questions real quick, I mean, I would love to hear. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Oh. <laughs> nope. Talking to Siri, Siri's got questions. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, what, what are people, uh, all right. See, James said, talk a bit more about how to break enterprise accounts from home. Um, so yeah, James is asking, how do you, how can you break into enterprise accounts while they're distributed like this? Um, do you, do you have anything to chime in there, Tim, or I can run with it? 
Yeah, well, a little bit. I think, you know, for us, it's been a huge shift of everything we do from, from kind of going wide to very, 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 very targeted. And so we've got an ABM program going right now, as well as kind of more of an account based sales approach. And what we're trying to, uh, to, to support is, okay, there's a, there's a technical infrastructure point now that's a little bit harder to understand and companies are dealing with, especially enterprise companies. And so we've been able to, to leverage some of our resources um, in terms of like getting Salesforce expertise into accounts and just seeing how we can help support some of the, the critical challenges they're facing and then also see if, if we can solve their problems. So I think for the phone systems, that's been really where we've been focused and you know, that very customized, very personal approach, really understanding what they're challenged with today and what's a priority. And then from there, building that use case. So a lot of listening and then taking the, the resources that you might have and just offering, off, offering support, offering some help, offering ways to, you know, maybe diagnose the problem and support it has been very helpful in starting the conversation. Yeah, I mean, what I'm seeing on my end is it, it, there's definitely not a one size fits all for any of this. Um, so, you know, it takes a lot of experimentation. What, what's working, what's not, um, adjusting your strategy. Um, some things we've seen that does work, and, and a lot of these are counterintuitive, which more often than not is a reason why it works. Um, but, you know, for instance, we've had a great, uh, a really great uh, success rate calling into companies that have announced things like uh, they've done a hiring freeze um, or they're, they're cutting budget. Um, and so for us as a data provider, like that sounds counterintuitive. Like, why are you going to try and sell them on a new service? But especially for the enterprise where they almost certainly have one and sometimes two or three solutions around this. A lot of times they're looking to either save cost off of that or consolidate. Um, and so it winds up being a great time as if you have a technology solution, um, especially if you're not you know, the highest cost uh, provider out there, um, to use that as an opportunity while people are really, basically everything's on the table right now. Yeah. Um, they're considering everything. So you know, finding things that are sort of counterintuitive like that um, and using stuff that, that's in the news or is out there um, you know, there's also things all the way down to like times of day to call and stuff like that. I mean, people have known for a long time, you know, the very start of the day, the very end of the day are best times to call and get somebody on the phone. Um, it's doubly so now because people don't have morning commutes or afternoon commutes and, and out of work. Um, so now they've got extra hours in the morning and the evening to be productive that, that normally they would have been largely unreachable. Um, so, you know, double down on those things during, during times and, and, you know, again, just experiment, figure out what's working, what's not, um, and, you know, double down on the stuff that's working, kill the stuff, obviously, that's not. Yeah, for us, I mean, we've seen a 20% increase in just phones being answered. And so that's one of the things that we've been really focused on is, is obviously calling the right people and not, and really being focused on who we're calling and identifying. The mobile phone's been the one that's been the primary call. Um, but 20% increase in, uh, in conversations because of it. That's great. The, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd love to dig into a little bit more with you on the, on the side. We can dig into it offline about, you know, how you guys are seeing that. Cause, um, you know, I've heard conflicting things. I've heard some people say it's damn impossible to get in front of anybody on the phone. And I've heard others where they've connected better. And I think, again, this is going to be down to, you know, what, what are your tactics that you're using to do that? Because uh, more than ever, one size fits all does not work right now. No, no. And that's where I think like really from those enterprise accounts, you have to be very account based and really look at what their challenges are because most of their priorities for optimizing a system has probably gone off the table. And now they're just trying to keep things together or solve the problems and the gaps that they're facing that are, that are brand new and, and immediate. Um, and I think that's where we've seen conversations either really go fast in that space or go dark a little bit just because they, they have other challenges that they need to solve for. Yeah, I've seen a lot of the same thing. It's it, things have either moved really, really quickly or they've died. There's not been a whole lot of middle ground. Yeah. Well, cool. Uh, we're nearly 10 minutes over here. If anybody has uh, anything burning to, to drop in here at the last minute, we'll certainly field it. But otherwise, um, we'll let you guys go. Um, like I said, we will, uh, uh, we've got contact information here on the deck. Uh, we'll send an yep. email with a link to the recording in the deck. You can also reply to that email if you have any additional questions or anything for either one of us. Um, let's see. One second.
Uh, all right, we got one last one. Uh, Lyndon's asking, uh, we're in a new market finding it hard to find traction with consumers. They're a corporate catering company that has pivoted to bringing people ultra safe meals. This has made our sales team become more marketing than sales because we've gone to B2B to B2C. To to is there any input that you could give? Wow, that is loaded. <laughs> That's tremendous. Um, so in the Sacramento region, we've got a few companies that do the, the meal, meal prep delivery for kind of, you know, and they're, they're poised. If you think about it with the mobile app and, and making that transaction easier, they're, they're poised to be able to um, take on this market. I think in tra that's a huge transition for a company is my first thought, Jason. I don't know where you're at with that, but I think making it as, as transactionally easy for consumers is, is the best thing you can do right now. And everybody's eyes and everybody's um, you know, thoughts are in social media and, and in some of those channels. So I think that's huge. And, and trying to go maybe back to those corporate accounts and saying, how can we deliver food to your, to your teammates or to your, to your team members that might need some support? Yeah, I mean that that shift in strategy is a huge one because I mean you go from you go from a one to a few selling model uh, where you've yeah. got a, a a purchaser at each each account or each company to uh, to many you know it's a it's a one to many many sales and marketing model where you've got to make many many smaller transactions um, and so I think you're absolutely right I mean the key the key to that game and that transition is efficiency. Um, yeah. you, you've got to, you've got to find the most efficient channels for getting the word out to as many people as possible. We also have to make, you know, the, the onboarding and transactions as, as efficient as humanly possible, because there's, there's a very real cost to each one of those interactions that occur. Um, and so your, your number of interactions and your revenue per interaction has, has gone, you know, number has gone up, revenue per has gone down. And so efficiencies are going to have to, uh, to really, really be in there. Um, yeah. I think word of mouth is critical, right? Like if, if you have an HR manager that you can get out and say, look, your team might be hurting. People might have pay cuts. Things might be going on. People might be furloughed. If you need to get people a resource where they can get a meal for a good price and a, and a good healthy option, send this out to your teams and they can order in, in that geo or in that area. And that I think might be that might be my one little, little tactical piece. Yeah, the uh, the other piece would be, you know, you do have an existing network of the of the employees at those companies that you have been selling to in the past. So, you know, these are obviously also individuals and families whenever they leave the office. So, you know, yep. using that as a channel as much as you possibly can, uh, both as you know as individual customers as well as people to help you get the word out. Um, and even if you don't have those individual, you know, employees contact information, if you've got good relationships with those businesses, you can ask them to spread the word to their employees for you as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, all best wishes to you in that. I mean, anytime that you're doing a pivot like that, that's, that's a huge challenge and undertaking. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and wrap it up here, Tim. Um, I, hey, thank you, Jason. Great having you on here as always. And thanks everybody for joining us today. Thanks guys.